Welcome everyone, the Costume Society of America thanks you for joining us today on Dress and Drinks in our series Conversations on Dress. And with that, I'm super excited to welcome to our conversation uh, from the Alabama Department of Archives and History, um, uh, the senior Diane Barnard, the senior collections curator of the Alabama Archives, uh, uh, Department of Archives and History. Following a lifelong passion for fashion and history, Diane left a job at a medical lab uh, in technology to gain a PhD in consumer and design sciences from Auburn University. Excellent choice, Diane. Um, after an extensive history of diverse experience, Diane now serves as a senior collections curator of the Alabama Department of Archives and History. In this role, she works with a variety of items collected since 1901. Diane loves the equally varied workload and objects and can leave her day and and which leave her days unpredictable, as we all know and experience daily. Um, our drink for the evening is, of course, the classic Alabama Slammer. Um, so that recipe is in the chat. And again, a, a continuous shout out to Ann Wass for the alcohol-free version, the Love Tap also an excellent name. So um, <clears throat> so thank you all for joining. All right, you see a shot here of the front of our building, the Alabama Department of Archives and History in Montgomery, Alabama. It is a beautiful building. We are also Alabama's uh, world of the war memorial. That's the back. This is how we started in 1901 in the Senate office chambers and the Capitol is directly across from our front and the, the legislature met every four years and so they had to take everything down uh, while the legislators were meeting and then they put it all up again. We predate the National Archives by about 35 years. That's just another shot of it and, well I didn't get the whole picture but anyway this is what you see across from our front windows it's a very beautiful site and that's the Alabama Capitol okay we I just wanted to say we turned 200 in 2019 and so to some of our listeners maybe we're just a drop in the bucket but what we have is, you know, everything that we take in has to do with the state of Alabama and telling the story of the state of Alabama. We do have a few other things, but that is our purpose and our goal is mm -hmm. to celebrate and support the state. And so I just wanted to give you a short tour of our textile storage area. We are in the process of doing some moving around. This is pre-move, so please enjoy this. I'm so excited to be able to give you a quick walkthrough of our textile storage area. It will be an opportunity to have other people see the collection that we do have. As I wow. walk through, and this is going to be very quick, I'm going to point out various things and this is just going to be an introduction but right here uh, you can see we have racks of quilts we have approximately 225 quilts we have them on rolls and then we have them in boxes um, all packed and stored according to museum best practices as we walk up the aisle you can see boxes we have linens and clothing and we have accessories and farther on up here we have a very large collection from Martha Pullen an embroidering and uh, smocking expert and we're very fortunate to have some of her collection and we're going to turn the corner here you can see our oversized quilts you can see all the way down the line where we have military uniforms we have fraternal and uh, political association garments and uniforms over on the left we have cabinets with particular 
collections from political figures, the Wallace, uh, first ladies' garments. Down here we have hats and shoes and accessories. And, as, and we begin our f extensive flag collection. And on the other side, we have more flags and we have uh, uniforms and equipment from almost every war, starting from the War of 1812 all the way through the War on Terror. Wow. Um, your your storage area is fantastic, Diane. That's awesome. Our textile storage what? area. Here, let me go on. There's a short, another section I wanted to show you real quickly called, okay. um, it's Alabama Museum called Voices, and we have textiles there also. So this is just going to be a quick run through. This is the entrance as you come in, and these pictures change, rotate. This is one of our older quilts, 1810. And we tell the story of Alabama as you go through. How often do you rotate these out? Uh, well, we are beginning the process right now, so it's been about four to five years. But that could be sooner if an object, you know, an artifact needs to be moved. You know, the lighting and everything is made, so they can, they'll be okay for around four to five years. How large is your gallery? That looks amazing. This is a fairly large gallery. We have another Native American gallery that's attached or right before this one. So the two together make a very comprehensive picture of the state. We have a large collection of uniforms. There's Hank Williams. This is our new acquisitions case where we rotate out, rotate out about once a year with some, you know, particularly interesting uh, things that we've gotten during the year. Okay, I'm going to start. I just picked out my favorites, and I have a lot of them. So here we go. We're going to start with Sarah Hainsworth Gale. This is one of our older uh, garments from the early 18 teens. She was the wife of the fourth governor of the state, but her story is one that uh, is, it was common for that period of time. She came from Virginia with her family when she was about six, settled into Greensboro, married uh, uh, John Gale, and they lived in a very isolated part of the, the, the state before statehood in 1819. She lived a very lonely life. They had children, her husband was gone a lot, but her story is one that was re repeated often. This gown is that beautiful muslin, unlike what we can get now. We have had this conserved. These spots you see right here were darker. I'm going to move on. This is the back of it. Oh, how lovely. And the, the uh, front, beautiful work here and on the sleeve caps, the back of it. The classic design for this kind of gown, but it has such beautiful hand, you know, workmanship and it's all handmade. And like I said, this is early 18 teens. Same oh, thing those around tiny here. Pin tucks. It, those are amazing. Gorgeous. Those are astonishing. Look at that. Those are gorgeous. Uh -huh. And it's all hand done and they are so regular. Stitches are so perfectly regular. Another okay, the last one thing I want to do is hand stitch a pin tuck. <laughs> this is one of my personal favorites. It's a dress, a work dress cotton work dress from Winifred 
Winifred Bryan Whitfield. And um, it's around 1823, 1825. And it, one of the cool things to me is, this is the back of it. it. I had to lay it out flat because you can see it's uh, not in the best condition. Yeah. Some interesting things, you know, features. Oh. On. But you can see this mark on the right side looks like mm -hmm. a char, like a they, uh, you know, a spark hit it. Well, that is all across the front. It was a work dress, and work dresses just really don't survive. And so That's we're very amazing. fortunate to have something like this. She was the mother of um, Nathan. Whitfield, who built Gaines, Gaineswood in Demopolis, Alabama, an excellent example of this style of architecture. So, oh, what a beautiful home. It is, yeah. She never lived here. We have that dress because he built it from 1843, excuse me, 1843 to 1861. He worked on this, but she was in Virginia. That's how we got that dress. We've got about 225 quilts, and this is the Mount Ida wedding quilt, and it is signed. This was a, a Mallory, Welch, and a few other families, and they were all wrapped up together, and one of them was getting married, and um, they made this wedding quilt, and they dated it and signed it. You can see some of these signatures around oh, here. Wow. And this was a purchased, a purchase border. A few uh, enlargements here. This this work, this craftsmanship is gorgeous. Very That's interesting. That's amazing. Yeah. That's really beautiful. Wow. It's a I mean, very the large. Work, the applique work, the quilt work alone, it's all really gorgeous. And look at the quilting. Yeah. That is just amazing. The only thing that's really showing signs of wear are some of the brown um, mm. appliques. But other than that, it's in excellent condition. Here's another close up of that. So, is this rose appliqued onto the quilt or is it actually yes. sewn exactly. into it? Oh, yeah. fantastic. Wow. Yeah, it's beautiful. So, another. Oh, and the way. embroidery is lovely too. So this is around 1851 when they made this. This was uh, it was made by enslaved women on the Sarah Ann Stewart um, Callery or Callery Callier um, plantation. It was woven and sewn by the enslaved women of that plantation in approximately 1862 to 1863. The workmanship on this is also very beautiful, very exacting, indicating a very uh, accomplished seamstress. So this was for the, quote, mistress of the plantation. And mm -hmm. I, here at, at the Alabama Archives, we tell the story of our history from the good to the very ugly. So, and this is part of our history. We I try to address that. Um, because, that but, was that was one of my big questions um, as we were starting to prepare for this. Is thinking about, you know, the the challenge, the the history of Alabama is mm -hmm. everything, you know, and uh, given and and how do you grapple with all of that? How do you grapple with some of the objects that you have that have changed meaning over time that have yeah still hold power and things of that nature. So that's really like, that, that must be one of the most challenging things to, to address as a curator. We, um, we don't back away from the subject of enslavement because it was part of our history and we are trying to build stronger bonds with those families and encourage us a cooperate, a cooperative effort to talk about our state. Um, we have a lot, it's very interesting that we have um, equal justice initiative 
uh, memorial here to lynching. We have the Rosa Parks um, history here. We have a lot of things in Montgomery showing the full story. And so we do a lot of work with trying, you know, co cooperating and presenting the story as it happened. You can't learn about it if you try to hide it. So we don't, we don't do that here. Excellent. Thank you. Okay. This is an unknown owner. Don't know who these pants belong to. These are uh, in, around 1865. It was late in the Civil War. Uh, cotton. I love to show these to people because um, it's not until you see something like this that you understand that so many of the Southern soldiers were conscripted scripted and especially toward the end they were just rounding up everybody they could find and this is what they went to fight in these are around late 1850 to early 1860s and uh it's what you might call homespun simply because it it was made at home and it has the patches on the knee and unfortunately we don't know who it belonged to but then, like what a well-worn pair of pants my gosh yeah i mean look at the 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 hem and the cuff of the pants um just all of the like that's that's an incredibly that's incredible we're very fortunate to have we have lots of uniforms but we have very little this is really the only one like this that we have to, and it really helps us tell the story of the condition of the state by the time we got to 1865. Mm -hmm. Okay, and this is really interesting. This was um, Private Henry Haynes. He, uh, Alabama and Mississippi would often, their units would often just sort of meld together and then come apart and meld back um, because, you know, we share a border with Mississippi. Um, this is in 1865 a very interesting thing i just learned this week this is called the shepherd's hat and toward the end of the civil war the confederate government was buying up in england all of these shepherd's hats to for their men to wear and the gentleman i was talking to showed me some documents and some pictures of actual you know them being worn but the story on it and it's kind of it's about a quarter of an inch thick so it would be pretty warm and also pretty hot but there's a hole right there that you see and there's another one around toward the front and the man just who wore this private uh hames said that he had been grazed by a bullet and so it entered and left just went right up above his ear and that's what the holes in this are. Wow. Yeah. So it that's I mean, that looks like just a felt blank. It doesn't even really yeah. look like much of a hat. It's just this it, it's what you would call a blank and that you know they were cheap. That's how come they could get them. And you know, they were just something that people wore out in the field, but you know, England did not support the Confederacy like the Confederacy thought they would. They were still able to buy things at a, you know, on a hit or miss basis. Right. We did still, you know, the Confederates did still have um, wool coming in through the blockade, but but not as much as they would have if the no, blockade was not there. So that's just one of my favorite things. I, I really like to look at that. Okay. This is Matthew um, Brady's photo of General, uh, Lieutenant General Joseph Wheeler. This is one of my favorite things simply because we got the uniform from uh, the uh, Confederate Museum in Richmond, and we needed to do some research and dating on this. And so you see this star right here down at the bottom. It's a little bit wonky. 
and I looked at a lot of other uniforms and that star just lined up just perfectly, but this one did not. And so um, it, it was the only one that we looked at that didn't line up. And so if we look back in several pictures, this picture and some others, it was how we were able to identify that the uniform that we have is more than likely the one he wore when Matthew Brady took his photo in 1861. So oh, wow. it, it, that was really That's fun. That's some sleuthing. That's some sleuthing. Yeah, it was really fun. So, and we have uh, pants and we have his um, epaulets when he was just a lieutenant in early 1860 to 1861. So this is that another note is amazing. I mean, the, and I love how, uh, the, the arrangement of the buttons, how they come in so tight at the waist. Yes. Yes. Now we don't think this was something, obviously he didn't wear this every day. He didn't wear this in the field. Um, yeah, yeah. it was, you know, for, for dress occasions, we do have a dress collar for an enslaved man, W.T. King, was a very large slave owner in Alabama around Selma. This was 1855. You can see the engraving here on the necklace. I hope you can. Oh, yeah. Can, can you see it? Mm-hmm. So uh, I've never heard of this object. Tell me more about it. That's... Well, like... Um, if they were, if he was having a very important dinner meeting or something, and he was a, uh, you know, enslaved in the house, he might wear something like this. If he was out on the street in a special um, event with his master, he might wear something like this. Oh, wow. That locks right there. Yeah. And so when it's on, it's on. And he, yeah. he is identified. And um, it's not a pretty picture. I mean, to, uh, to try to imagine this. But again, it's it's part of our story. It's in our voices gallery. And I personally had never seen one of these before until I came to work here. That's really fascinating. And it's fascinating, oh, macabre, uh, and sad yeah. all at the same time. Okay. So that's 1855. Now we're going to jump up a little bit. Put these in here. This is hair jewelry. I love we, hair jewelry. I so love hair jewelry. We okay. We have a large collection of it, and and some um, hair uh, wreaths. R e a r yeah w r e a t h s wreaths. Um, my boss Ryan Blocker. Uh, collects these also hair jewelry there's a wonderful you know it was a morning or in memory um for these your are, loved ones they're gorgeous thank you ryan who's in the audience for collecting these because these are also macabre but also gorgeous i yeah. have a huge fascination of hair jewelry okay diana i might have to come to alabama just to see your hair jewelry collection. well we have quite a bit of it and, um, I, you know, Goaty's Magazine, Goaty's Ladies Magazine would, on a pretty regular basis during this 1850, 1870, 1880, um, give instructions on how to do this, patterns. I mean, if you go back and look in the ladies' magazine, mm -hmm. there was quite a, not just in for mourning either, this was a decorative art, a craft that young oh, ladies absolutely. learned. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it was, it was, it was, it was a very specific thing and you wore it at very specific times, but yeah. it was turning that lock of hair into a beautiful remembrance. Yeah. Um, was, so again, yeah. it has this sort of interesting kind of today we view it as kind of macabre yeah. um, because nobody saved like, I mean, who has still locks of hair except for when we were children, maybe. Uh -huh. um, um, 
But yeah, it's not like people are like, now I'm going to cut your hair and make it into something I want to wear. Um, it's that like is a very brooches. You know, they had brooches and necklaces and pins and, you know, oh, the whole gamut of it. The all. whole gamut of what lockets where they would put little things in it around pictures. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So I, I like to tell like people it. these because you get one of two reactions. Oh, that is so cool. Or get me out of here. That is so awful. People Have never are on the fence about it. <laughs> You're correct. You're totally correct. It is it is yay or nay. There's no in between. Yeah. Have you guys done an exhibit of hair jewelry? Because that I would come to see. <laughs> I don't not not in while I've been here. Yeah. It's such a breadth of things. I'm completely I'm so surprised and love all of it. Okay. Now we're moving this sort of transition slide. This is the Yarborough quilt. Obviously, what we would call a quote crazy quilt. But the interesting about this one, it was made between 1841 and, and 1959. And there are pieces of fabric from the, the Yarbrough and uh, Strudwick family that were used in this quilt. And let me show y'all there. And some of them are dated, like this one has a date on it. Oh, wow. And little pieces scattered all the way through it and some of it is you know for wedding clothes um honeymoon clothes all kinds of things but one of the cool things is we have a book mary from mary sturdwick a strudwick yarborough and she diagrammed the squares and she told you where to start and she tells you about every single square where the fabric came from about the people in it it is a completely amazing amazing quilt that's amazing and that support documentation or that other documentation uh -huh. to, like so we have the quilt and, the, and this little notebook and it's really fascinating to sit down and read and it does cover from uh 1841 to 1959 the the, the fabric and it was finished in 1959 yeah so let's see and the stitching on it like is just yeah. beautiful look at that it has so many kinds of embroidery stitches i mean it's truly amazing let's see okay this is my this is ryan's one of her favorites this is a dress of bossy O'Brien Hundley. She was an American American suffragist, um, and in this well across the country, but in the South too. She lived in Montgomery and in Birmingham, and um, she had this dress commissioned on her honeymoon in 1897 in Paris, and it's a beautiful green velvet with satin and all kinds of embroidery. There were these oh, wow. gold up here and this blue. But these colors uh, identified were identified with the suffrage movement in the United States. Green, cream or white, and this blue. And so these colors were chosen very specifically. Okay. She was married in um, 1897, but the movement, you know, had started before that time. And so by the time they got married, she was already very active in the suffrage movement. And um, she traveled and debated and worked for very hard to get the vote for women and there's what the bottom of it looks like wow that's gorgeous it's absolutely gorgeous and see you can see the velvet is kind of uh i was just going to ask is there a sort of variegation or a pattern it's a very, it's well open? it's because it's, it's like really pressed open pleat it's very interesting it has like striations running through 
the velvet. Yeah. You wouldn't call it crushed by any means, but it's, you know, it is a patterned green velvet. It's really lovely. Yeah. So, oh, the, and then we're going to jump up some to the 1940s. This is a quilt that we have that we call it the J.L. Carr quilt. Uh, he enlisted in uh, 1942 in the Navy and he sent messages to his wife when he could. He spent most of his time in the Pacific and they made these um, quilt squares like this one over here on the far uh, well, my left. He enlisted in the Navy in August, on August 25th, 1842, and it goes all the way to 18, excuse me, 1942 to 1946. And it was made by his wife, his mother, and his grandmother. And wow. it goes all the way until when he, uh, you know, got out. But we also have, he rescued a chaplain that the boat was hit by a torpedo pedo everybody landed in the water he rescued a chaplain and the chaplain's bible we have that and we have um oh, let me go here here they are and we have um materials from her her dog tags and identification card and all this sort of thing when she went with him to california for training and she worked in one of the munitions plants as the one of the rosie the riveters so we have this whole archival and textile collection for them that tells their story um now interesting thing about this this is his wife and a dear friend when I was a fourth in fourth grade. She was my best friend. And this is was her mother's sister. And I didn't know that until I got here. So it's kind of near and dear to my heart. And so, small world. I mean, really. Yeah, very small world. <laughs> so now we're going to go to the 30s. I sort of got stuck that in there anyway i love this thing i just when we found this it had been there for a long time but the box had not been open there wasn't any call for it and i just went bonkers over this it's orange velvet pajama ensemble and it's we were told in the donation uh question the donors questionnaire that it was 1930 to 1940 and her mother made it for her and i'll show wow. you some, yeah here's some details oh i love a dolman sleeve that is awesome it that's is amazing beautiful and if you'll notice all again it's not crushed but it's that sort of strided i call it yeah um oh and velvet. those frogs are amazing uh-huh <laughs> and this side of your hand they're amazing this belt wraps it's, twice around the waist. And this is a pretty complicated closure. There's a, a closure right here of snaps. And then this part, um, there's a part that goes up under the frog section and it has snaps and hooks and, and everything. You know, you have to get it just right before you can actually say, okay. It, is it a, done. is it a, is yeah. it so is the bottom are they pants like pajamas um is it like a jumpsuit or is it more yes. like a it's all one piece it's like a jumpsuit oh but the but the legs are pants but the legs are pants yeah wow okay i want this this is awesome i love <laughs> well, this I, it's mine i love it so <laughs> <laughs> i love this this is amazing that is super cool so here is another, I just wanted to show you, see how beautifully her mother made everything, you know, yeah. just perfectly on the gray. Everything just is beautiful on this. And those three little buttons covered in satin right there with the loops. That is just gorgeous. Yeah. 
So this is from the same family. It was made for another person, but it is the same family. And the mother did make this too. It's 1930s silk velvet. And you can see it has these little rows of pieces that were constructed and, and sewn onto the edge of the sleeve. And it has this beautiful little ruffle, that 30s, you know, there's always a V or something like that. Yeah, yeah. Looking at things from the 30s in this wide treatment across the ear. But the real part, beautiful part, is the back. It droops, comes all the way down to the the small of the back and these flowers are going from the sleeves all the way around it. Oh, wow, those are gorgeous. It is just, and the back of it has a little bit of a train, not much, but this is, it's just stunning. Her, like, this is stunning work. This is, I mean, and also to be doing this in silk velvet, I mean, uh -huh. like, like the most friendly fabric you could possibly want to sell, yeah. silk velvet. <laughs> Okay, now we move on to another favorite. This is the inaugural ball gown of Jamel Folsom. And she wore it in 1955 in homage to the a major crop of Alabama, which was cotton. This is cotton sateen with mm. these little rhinestones all over it. And it's, you know, gathered and tacked. It took us a lot of petticoats to get the fullness um that it originally oh, you know yeah. originally would have been but we had this in an exhibit of some other gowns of governor's wives and women would come by and young girls would come by and say oh what a gorgeous wedding gown this is and it really does. It would be a beautiful wedding gown now. She was a very little lady, and her husband, Jim Folsom, or James Folsom, was oh, well over six feet. And wow. Yeah, so they made a really interesting pair. But this is one of our, you know, gorgeous um, inaugural gowns. We have a lot of first ladies gowns, and I had to put pop a lot of people's bubbles and say, well, hmm, uh, up to a certain point, these were, they belong to first ladies, but they were not their inaugural gowns. So got that story straightened out. Yes. Yes. That's very Here's challenging. Oh, that's gorgeous. Of that's the bodice. Beautiful. And you can see where the, it's tacked here. Yes. You can see that. Yeah. Oh, really lovely draping. Really mm -hmm. lovely draping. This is the peacoat prototype for Daniel Craig in as James Bond in Skyfall, designed by Billy Reed. He's just up in Florence, Alabama. So we have that prototype. And it's just cool. Yeah, that's um, beautiful. That's awesome. Some more. Just we we still are collecting. Oh, this excellent. is a swing oh, wow. coat from Natalie Alabama Channon, made of organic jersey. There's the top of it and that detail. And then that was it. Yeah. Perfect. Excellent. Um, Diane, thank you so much. What beautiful things that you have brought to share with us today. Um, how expansive is your collection? How many objects do you have in, let's say, in dress versus including the quilts, like just sort of objects of dress? Uh, we figured between what's in voices and what's in our collection, it's between four and 5,000 objects. Wow, that's amazing. Yeah. Um, Okay, let's open this up. This has been fantastic. Thank you, Diane. Well, thank totally you for well letting worth me visit. hear it. Um, so uh, let's open this up to questions. Do you know where the oh, unknown the owner, owner's pant, pardon me? She's talking about the pants, the homespun pants. Yeah, do you know where they came from? No, we don't because um, they have been here for eons almost and at one point 
the documentation and the uh, donor records were not just because of the way museums practiced. Um, we don't know who the donor was. Right. So we have a, a is, gem. Go ahead. I was going to say that's a very common story. Yes. <laughs> that we hear a lot. I mean, every especially when you get to a certain period, a certain time. Yes. You know, before really people were starting to like write these things down, or or you know got a lot of documentation people were just accepting things yeah. and trying to you know date them and do a little bit of stuff so it's not uncommon yeah um okay um a quote by marcy this hair jewelry reminds me of some straw earrings that i saw in france as the weaving pattern is the same yeah so like i said um, goaties goaties would um almost every month would have if not a large spread, a small spread with a pattern or some set of instructions on how to make these things. And so um, that doesn't surprise me that, you know, that it looks yeah, like yeah. something from yeah. Europe. Yeah. So if we want to go start making hair jewelry, no, we now have our primary <laughs> source. Uh, great document, fabulous documentation for the crazy quilt. Um, Liza, very funny. I thought that my projects took a while. <laughs> <laughs> Hundred years to make a quilt. Um, I love all of the velvet. Diane, thank you so much for your time today, oh, and you're for welcome. bringing and for bringing us these beautiful, really gorgeous things. Um, and so, I also want to thank um, everyone in the audience for attending. So, please follow the Costume Society of America on Facebook and Instagram. And lastly, if you enjoyed today's content, we implore you to make a small, a medium, a large donation um, uh, to help keep this content free. With that, one last time, I want to thank Diane Barnard for these beautiful, fascinating, interesting things. Um, and uh, I really, I look forward to meeting you in person at one point, Diane. Thank you so much for your time and this wonderful oh, presentation. It's totally my pleasure. Awesome. Thank you. Have a good Thank night, you. everyone. Stay safe and I'll see you in a month with our next episode on dress and drinks.